Okay, hello everybody. I'd like to tell you briefly about um, the link between farmers' rights and um, incentive mechanisms such as payments for agrobiodiversity conservation services. And um, well, you know, all of you have uh, seen a fair number of my presentations on on PACs, so um, I'm not going to go into huge detail um, about that. But uh, we've been uh, carrying out that work. Um, since, since 2009 now in a number of countries to which um, uh, can um, add uh, Slovenia to, to that list as, um, as well. Um, basically, um, what, what it involves is some sort of uh, prioritization protocol. We've been uh, developing the Weizmann approach for that, that um, combines uh, diversity information from ex situ collections with uh, with levels of threats and conservation costs, which allows us to identify a priority conservation portfolio, which can be allocated um, in a way that for any given limited conservation budget, you can maximize the diversity that, that you can conserve. Um, some of that priority portfolio will of course have uh, market potential and can be subjected to value chain uh, development types of approaches, but I think a large part either will have unknown potential or does not have the current market potential, but has high um, public good values. And so that's the part of the portfolio that, that one really uh, applies uh, these kind of incentive mechanisms to. We use um, competitive tenders to minimize intervention costs. I'll, I'll come back to, to that point in, in a little bit. Um, there's an ability to select communities into your conservation program based on um, social equity criteria. So not only minimizing costs, but also perhaps we would like to involve poorer farmers or younger farmers or more or, or female farmers. Um, uh, so there's a, a, a possibility to, to do that and to understand uh, what, what trade-offs uh, are, are involved sometimes, uh, for example, uh, you can you have to choose between choosing more female farmers or between choosing uh, more poorer farmers and so on. Um, as with, with most types of, uh, of, of PEZ, of Payment for Ecosystem Services, rewards are conditional, um, they're only paid if, if conservation contracts are fulfilled, um, but uh, unlike most PEZ, the way we've been working is, um, is by group level uh, rewards uh, community at, at the community level, and um, these are paid in kind. So we're not uh, talking about uh, cash in, in the hands of, of individuals. And since farmers have the opportunity to define their own participation conditions, I'll come back to the details of that in, in just a second, we also see that um, uh, this kind of approach contributes directly to actual implementation in practice of farmers' rights and the fair and equitable sharing of, of, um, of the use of, of genetic resources. Um, and the outcome of all of this, what we hope, is that it allows farmers to be able to diversify their livelihoods away from being based largely on agricultural production to uh, being able to sell a public good conservation service to, to the nation and um, just to provide you with some background of what we've been doing over the last year or so, uh, following some, some piloting of this a number of years earlier, the Ministry of Environment in Peru has been uh, very interested in, in, in the uptake of this. And so last year, and uh, again this year, this is exactly what's, what's happening uh, right now, um, we've held these, um, these workshops where we, we invite communities and explain to them how the process works. Last year we worked on a small part of our priority conservation portfolio for these um, for, for five quinoa varieties. This year we'll be working on, on quinoa and, and amaranth. Um, some 40 communities accepted the, the invitation. Um, from those we received uh, 30 uh, actual bid offers which, which covered a total of 370 farmers. And um, the kind of information that, that we ask for and that farmers are free to define for themselves is you know, assuming that they, they are interested in participating, then what area of their land or common land 
uh, is going to be dedicated to this activities. Uh, many of them are going to be involved, whether they have seed available, and if not, we facilitate access of that seed. Quite often it's not available because we are working with these, these rare, rare varieties, and what kind of reward um, they, uh, they, they require in order to be able to participate, given that there may be opportunity costs, um, reduced crop yields compared to, to commercial varieties, or time spent um, with the project team in, in monitoring and verification activities and, and so on, uh, what kind of rewards they uh, will require in order to be able to, to participate. And what we saw from those bid offers this year is um, conservation costs, I think, are fairly modest. And uh, since one doesn't have to re-intervene every year on the same varieties, those are not necessarily annual um, figures. As with, uh, with previous uh, experience with, with PACs, what we've seen is that there is indeed uh, an upward sloping uh, supply curve in terms of the conservation offers that, that one receives. So um, communities here at, um, at the bottom left, um, perhaps $100, $200, $300 per, per hectare, whereas some of the ones which are off the screen here would have required more than $16,000 per hectare. To, um, to be convinced to, to participate. So clearly it makes sense to be able to select those communities where for their own socioeconomic preferences and so on uh, mean that they, they already value those particular varieties in such a way that um, conservation interventions um, are fairly cheap to, to implement. Um, and of course this upward sloping supply curve suggests that the competitive tender uh, is capable of uh, helping us identify cost-effective uh, in intervention strategies compared to, for example, paying uh, a, a single um, uh, a, a single level of reward to to all communities. The types of rewards, as I mentioned, in kind at the community level, these are the ones from our our first experience in in 2011. And um, it's also interesting to note that some of these things, building materials, cement, and so on, will be split between the group members, presumably in proportion to the effort that they put in. Uh, other things here, like the processing machinery, would be uh, used by the group and perhaps access made to the broader community. And then things like school materials benefit the, the broader community. So interesting to see how different groups have preferences for different types of, uh, of reward. Um, this is from, from this year. This was at our reward handover ceremony, um, particularly high level here. We have the, um, the, the Vice Minister of Environment, the Vice Minister of, um, of, of Culture. We have representatives from um, uh, Finnish Resource Service and National Partners from, from the Ministry of Environment, the, uh, the heads of, of various uh, local institutions, Gene Bank University, and, um, and so on. You can see here some of the rewards uh, that have been requested this year. And um, I think if you look carefully here, you can see that some of the rewards um, are unexpected. We I quite often ask what the rewards will be used for, and they're gonna be used to build a, a storehouse for, for quinoa seeds or, or something, it can, can be the answer. Um, but this year we saw that a lot of mattresses had been um, requested and there was this surreal image of the mattresses being driven away through quinoa fields at, at the end of the uh, at the end of this uh, very colorful and um, high level e event so um, obviously didn't ask what those were going to be used for but uh, has given me new insight into that a, a good conservation farmer is a well rested conservation farmer uh, so putting all of this together, we can see, and, and this comes from the, the policy um, brief that um, Evelyn and, uh, and, and Michael and company, Ronnie, have been, uh, have been working on. Um, and you can see that the contribution of uh, payments for agrobiotic food conservation services makes to, uh, to, to, to farmers' rights. Um, we, we help to maintain traditional knowledge. There's, um, there's a, a sharing of, of benefits in terms of, of, of the rewards which are being paid. There's uh, participation in, um, in, in decisions um, about uh, what, what areas who will participate, um, which varieties 
that uh, that the farmers are interested in, um, in cultivating and and so on and then there's this aspect of, of seeds where as I mentioned before we're also facilitating access uh, there and um, uh, by and large when we've gone back to communities several years later we see that most farmers are still maintaining the, the varieties that were the subject of a PAX intervention in, in earlier years even though that there were no for, was no further intervention they've kept the seed they've sold some to to neighbors um, they've been very pleased with the quality of, of the seed and so on um, I'd like to digress just just a little bit um, so that was the main part about, about farmers' rights per se, um, but I'd uh, also like to um, continue to stress the, the, um, the, the, the livelihood aspect as well as some of the cost aspects. So here, uh, very quickly, is the kind of back of the envelope calculation of what it would cost to uh, conserve some 300 species or varieties. Um, not necessarily of, of any single crop and uh, a number of, of assumptions including a conservation goal which we worked with with our national partners in, in order to, to define and um, what you can see here is that depending on your timeline we're talking about between one and two million dollars uh, a year to, to achieve that which breaks down to uh, just under two hundred thousand dollars so even if we were to, to double that, um, because we consider that the monitoring and administration costs and the staff time of biodiversity and so on um, uh, would, would, would amount to, to more, um, it, that's still a fairly modest cost compared to the, the kind of levels of um, expenditure that, that are plowed into, into conventional agriculture. And um, the, the other aspect that I'd like to highlight here is that there is this debate within the world of payment for ecosystem services about um, the degree to which such incentive mechanisms should be used to support livelihoods um, as opposed to simply achieving the environmental goal that they, they set out to achieve. And um, some well-respected observers consider that you know, one instrument should, be, uh, it should mainly be applied to, to one thing, uh, which is the, the environmental goal, and that there are more effective ways to, to achieve poverty alleviation. Um, but uh, we're, we're interested in seeing to what degree the, the kind of rewards, uh, I mean, within, within this, this sort of broader debate, the, uh, a new line of research for us uh, relates to the degree to which the kind of rewards which we're being asked for uh, are actually contributing to livelihoods and, and, and poverty alleviation and um, although there are plenty of non-market values to, to take into account um, I think what we've seen in Latin America so far is that there are relatively modest amounts uh, being, being requested by farmers this is not going to change their lives particularly if we're working on relatively few varieties at, at a time and so the degree to which this really allows farmers to diversify their livelihoods away from agricultural production to uh, public good provision uh, is, is very much open to, to question but uh, we do have a project funded by FAO this year and we're hoping for the results to um, that we'll be able to present these at, at the COP in, uh, in, in December this is where it's been carried out in Peru and in Mexico and um, basically we're exploring the degree to which um, farmers might be able to participate in multiple incentive schemes so um, not just for a few crop varieties but for many crop varieties but also for uh, threatened livestock breeds uh, threatened tree genetic resources perhaps uh, things related to soil and, and water quality ecosystem services as as well um, so would is, is it feasible for farmers to participate in in those in in such multiple schemes um, there's, there's this issue of overcoming fragmented institutional landscapes, obviously, and then there's the question of whether incentive levels have been set at a high enough level 
uh, in order to attract a sufficient number of farmers so that your environmental goals uh, can can be achieved. So that's what's uh, going on this year. And um, I look forward in a few months to being able to tell you how that uh, all, all worked out. So um, once again, I'll, I'll just close with, with this slide here of um, one of the representatives of our communities receiving a social recognition award from, from the two vice uh, ministers. And uh, that was in addition to the actual in-kind rewards which, which the community uh, group, group received. So um, we also hope to continue to be able to um, advertise and sell packs as a means of uh, implementing farmers' rights in practice. Thank you very much.